Hey guys, welcome into another episode of 410 Sports Talk. I'm James Tasco, along with my co-host Glenn Martin and a face you guys might recognize, Evan Washburn from CBS Sports. Really excited to have you on the show, Evan. Thanks for taking the time. Oh, I'm pumped to be with you guys. Yeah, I, I came across the show on YouTube while doing all my deep dives on Ravens and everything NFL and, and enjoyed the content. So excited to be a part of it. Awesome. We appreciate the compliment. We're excited to, to uh, peel the onion back a little bit and get your insider take on the Ravens. What's going on this year? Get all your opinions and, uh, and take. So Glenn, I'll let you kick it off. Sure. Yeah. I got to start with, uh, with, with Greg Roman. It's been an interesting couple of years from him because last year it seemed like he was beloved here in Baltimore. He couldn't, he could do no wrong. Every play call worked. Uh, There's touchdowns left and right, but this year he's been the, the, the center of a lot of criticism. So so my question for you, Evan, is this is the Roman criticism warranted? Is it valid? And and what does he have to do to try and silence some of those critics? Well, criticism is part of the the whole process, the machine, if you will. And and the coaches know that, the players know that. We in the media that kind of function as the the go between from the fans to the professional coaches and athletes understand it as well. And it, it's really what drives the engine that is professional sports. So. That, to me, is not an issue. Whether or not Greg Roman deserves criticism or not, I mean, I think at times all of these guys deserve criticism, and we deserve criticism for being uh, you know, overreactionary. Uh, I kind of put fans out on an island. They're allowed to be fans and fanatics. That's kind of what goes with the territory. I, I, I look at it this way with, with Roman and really this team in general. The high is never as high as you think it is, and the low is never as low as you think it is. I think Greg Roman and the entire staff did a phenomenal job last year building this thing out. And we saw it come to fruition with a historic season. Now we're seeing the growing pains and the maturation of that system as defenses become more aware of it and as they've had to adjust due to just an incredible shift in personnel across that offense that I don't think, at least in the initial part of the season, was highlighted enough, and now it's becoming obvious as guys go down with injuries. So the criticism is warranted because it's part of the business, uh, but I don't think he is the singular reason why fans aren't seeing what they saw last season. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great point. I'm kind of feeding on to that first question from Glenn, um, one of the questions I had uh, regarding the coaching staff, and kind of Glenn and I have talked about how John and even like uh, – uh, Tomlin, they're different in that they're not calling plays. They let their DCs and their OCs do their thing and, and work in their own spheres. But in the first half and the second half of the Colts game, we saw two completely different offenses. Um, and so at halftime, do you think that is John, I mean, based on what you know, is John the type of guy that will go to Greg and, and pull, I'm saying this politely, but like reiterate the importance of the run game, right? Like, you know what I mean? P- kind of light a little fire under him and say, Hey, this is what we need to do. This is our identity. Is that something that that happens in that, uh, you know, in the Ravens coaching staff? I mean, I think you brought it up with, with Tomlin and, and some of these head coaches. It's becoming rare, and, and I really think it, it should be more common. I look at what the Ravens have created, which Pittsburgh has, what, I mean, New England's kind of its own behemoth, but it's the CEO. I mean, John Harbaugh, Mike Tomlin, they're the president of, of that team in terms of seeing everything and it's their responsibility to see everything so absolutely whether it's halftime in game first series second series third quarter fourth quarter if they don't like what they're seeing and they want to see something different or they want to see a change uh whether it be pace play calling whatever it might be absolutely that's why the head coach is the head coach so specific to that Colts game I think it was pretty obvious what happened in the second half they picked up the tempo they allowed Lamar to play at his pace which then permeates through that team and they play at that confident efficient level that we saw but uh to to say that it's specific to halftime and that's the only time the head coach is going to identify a a change or a need for change no I think it's happening constantly I mean I've heard this from coaches across the league that if I don't like a play call that's coming through and I hear it on the headset I will change it. It's my call. And and that's what comes with the territory and the title. All right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, it's uh, ultimately he is in charge uh, no, no matter what. So, but you, you're fortunate enough to be on the sideline a lot of these games. And, and I'm question, I'm kind of curious, 
do you feel a different a different energy amongst the players on the sidelines through through the first nine games in comparison to last year? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. I and, and it's been fun and, and I think uh, helpful to see it from week one. Our crew was there in in Baltimore when they played the Browns, and it very much felt like I mean, outside of the fact there were no fans there, and it was the weirdest atmosphere. I've ever experienced at M&T Bank Stadium. Uh, but yes, it was that offense was humming. The defense was making big plays. Everyone saw smiles on the sideline. And, and it looked like the 2019 version. Now, over the course of this year, I've seen them in Philly. I've seen them in Indy. So it's kind of a stop along the way. And the energy, yes, it is different based off of what's happening on the field. It is at times that simple. You're not going to have the fun-loving Mark Ingram up on the bench as the MC of everything and the defense of Brandon Williams dancing if they're not playing well, as they shouldn't be. Uh, and, and what I think I, I saw in the indie game specifically in terms of energy that I thought would translate more to, to Sunday, while I also, as I've watched back that New England game more and more, I, I think it is an anomaly because of the environment, the conditions, um, and some of what they dealt with on an injury front. Uh, but I thought at the indie game, there was this sort of in the second half, sort of a, a collective sense of, OK, this is who we are. We're not going to be exactly what we were in 2019. It might be a bit ugly at times, but we found a way to beat a really good team, a solid team in the Colts. When we weren't at, at our best, guys got nicked up in the first half and our defense didn't practice for much of the first uh, that, that whole week. So I. Uh, I'm still holding out thought that that could be who this team is, even though um, walking away from the New England game, everyone's uh, got their head down. Yeah, that's interesting because I feel like one of the things that you're kind of describing is the difference between last year, I feel like we were playing with house money and this year there are high expectations, right? And so when you see something go well in the Colts game, it's almost like a sigh of relief, right? You hear this like, all right, like you said, this is who we are. Totally different than 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 last year, certainly. Uh, but one of the guys we want to talk about, and we've had uh, you know his strength and conditioning coach on the show is Marquise Hollywood Brown. You know, the off season, he made a lot of noise with the Instagram videos and putting on the weight. Um, and he's also made some headlines a few weeks ago uh, when he publicly criticized his involvement in the offense. Some fans, including us, you know, we mentioned that Hollywood needs to earn more targets by make, making the most of the targets he's been he's been getting. What's your take on Hollywood and his involvement in the offense thus far? Well, look, I, I, I'll start with this. I, I think the, what he did in the offseason to get himself in a position where he is healthy, one, most importantly, but two, able to sustain the beating of an NFL season is commendable. And I think all those strides are, are still something that should be recognized. But the reality of what he does well at this point in this offense is going to be a challenge to seek the probably consistent production that he would like and that maybe fans that want to see those big plays downfield would like because I just don't at the moment see that as something that is going to be that uh, an aspect that this offense hangs their hat on I think they want it to be a layer to it but I'm just more of the belief that that there needs to be a stubbornness to do what it is this team does well and simplify things as best they can, even if defenses have tendencies on it. Because I'm of the belief that even if defenses know what they're running, if they run it effectively with Lamar's dynamic skill and what they have at the running back position and still at tight end with Mark Andrews, they can still be productive. And then Marquise becomes that, that big shot that can put a dagger in a team or change the momentum in a game but to expect him to be a heavily targeted player that's going downfield, I just don't see that as an identity for this offense this year. Now, that's not to say he can't do more in terms of coming across the middle, some of those uh, routes that you, you see, crossing patterns where Lamar's at his best when, when he's finding him over the middle. So uh, that's, a, that's a long way of saying that he can be frustrated, fans can be frustrated, but the ultimate goal is going to be for this team to be productive, efficient, and win. And I don't necessarily think that means shifting everything towards Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the the run game and how important it is to this offense. And, and we, we completely agree. And, and the running back position this season has kind of been an interesting one because they have so many good backs and normally that's a good problem, but 
it hasn't seemed to always been a an easy way to get these guys going when you have too many mouths to feed. Uh, so, in your opinion, how do the Ravens best use all these running backs? And and do they have? Is there a possibility they may have too many good running backs? I don't think it's a it, it's a problem right now because they all seem to have a, a healthy understanding and and sort of uh, team first uh, mentality. And I think it helps that one J.K. Dobbins is a rookie, so he's not going to come in and be selfish. It's just not a good way of, of doing business. <laughs> Gus Edwards is um, just a machine back there who's happy to do it would appear whatever the team asked him. And then Mark Ingram's that consummate pro at the at the at that vet position. So. I look at it like this, guys. The, the best way for this running back group to be productive and they all feel satisfied at the end of a game is for this offense to stay on the field and have those long clock-eating drives that we saw a lot of last season. And really what stood in the way of that, in my opinion, is this offensive line has just been a mess all year. And, I, you know, I haven't watched every one of your shows, so I hate to be redundant if you guys have focused on this. But that's the reality, fellas. I mean, mm -hmm. you lose Marshall Yonda. Skur is coming off a serious knee injury. And, you know, props to him for getting back. But he, there's no way he's 100% to start this season. And now he's kind of dealing with the snaps. And, you know, I saw him cut his hand, even though I don't think that's that big a deal. And then you lose Ronnie Stanley. And you kind of are figuring mm -hmm. things out at right tackle. Look, that's where it starts. Everything starts with this offense. You talk to these guys, if it's a, a player – more importantly, probably a coach, they'll tell you when this offense is at its best, it starts with that group up front. And that group just hasn't uh, mostly due to injury in the absence of Marshall Yonda been able to do what they did last year. So it's going to have a trickle down effect. Yeah, I kind of want to I want to stay on the offensive line here for a second, just because today uh, news came out that it looks like uh, Bradley Bozeman is going to be switching into he's going to be taking over the, the responsibilities at center. It looks to be that way right now based on that, you know, the, the performance that Skura had uh, in uh, in New England. That's something that Glenn and I have been talking about since the offseason. We really like the fact that Bozeman's an All-American center coming out of Alabama. He's big. We want to get bigger on the offense, you know, on, on the offensive line. What's your take on I, – I realize we don't want to be making wholesale changes and, you know, week – whatever we're in here, we're nine yeah. games in week 10. Uh, but what's – is there any optimism behind moving Bozeman into that center spot um, or are you not feeling too good about it? Well, if, if I'm a fan, I'm not feeling good, as you put it, with the amount of change that this offensive line has had to endure heading into week 11, James. And, and I think that, look, it's, it's by necessity, largely due to injury uh, when it comes to Ronnie Stanley and you know, Tyree Phillips getting nicked up and, and maybe he gets back in the mix, but he's still a rookie figuring it, things out at, at right guard. So now if, if is as you describe it, that's correct. The Bose moves to the center. Then now you're figuring out left guard. Uh, but the one thing I'll say, and, and this is one thing that I think is, is helpful for, for Ravens fans to remember, is that in some of this organization's most successful moments and seasons, mm -hmm. they've made drastic changes yep. at this point in the season, whether it's firing Cam Cameron uh, on, on the way to a Super Bowl. I mean, that's what I think, at the core of it, as I've thought about it since that indie game and over the course of the season, whether it's due to responsibilities for CBS and covering this team or just being around this city, it's that everybody needs to take a step back and say, it's like what we've experienced before. It's going to be a roller coaster. Our emotions are going to be in knots. We're going to be angry some Mondays. We're going to be confused some Mondays. But I still think this is a really good team. And look, they're having to do some wild things here in week 11, especially across that offensive line, managed through some injuries, but they've proven under, and I would say, again, it goes back to kind of the Harbaugh era, if you will, under his direction, they've made some big pivots at this point in the season and it's worked out. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point because we were watching the game this past Sunday. I think my brother said, this, this is just old school Ravens football. The, the, yeah. Every game goes down to the wire, has you sweating. We were spoiled last year, Evan, with, yeah. with all these blowouts and, and quite relaxing games. But, yeah, it didn't feel up. right, did it, fella? Oh, no, it didn't. It did not I felt guilty. Look, I'll be honest. I root, for, I root for people at this point, even though I love the city and I want to see everybody happy. I, I am not a, no longer really a fan. It's just, it, it's just not in me but I root for people. And so I got a bunch of people in my life who as much as you guys are attached to this team, 
and I, I would joke with them last year. I was like, this is not who you are. You, you're not the shiny team that the entire right. NFL is watching. You like it when everybody's saying, oh, these games are ugly. Uh, why do we have the, the, the Ravens in a primetime window? Is this going to be a 12-6 game? Like, that's, that's kind of what uh, I think of when I think that the way this team kind of is built, this organization, I should say, is built. And that's what I – I do think is is a reasonable way to view what could happen here in the remaining seven games and then on into the postseason. It's funny how even when a team tries to change their identity, it just you, you end up back home to where you need to be, right? It just it's funny how it works out that way. I'm glad the, that that uh, our identity is is not as consistent as the Browns and our story isn't the same. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's but a, uh, it's a much better yeah, uh, better identity, no doubt about so that. So the one thing I want to I want to talk about is Lamar Jackson. We talked about running backs, wide receivers, offensive line. Uh, Lamar Jackson's point: We're deep in the season. What do you think he can? Well, one, I think he's getting a little more blame than than uh, than's called for, uh, mm-hmm. but. I also think that every week there's things that he could do to, to improve, uh, you know, improve upon based on the fact that he's only 23. Uh, he's such a young player. What do you think that if anything that he can do at this point in the season, you know, maybe some quick tweaks that you could put your finger on and say, all right, maybe these are a couple of things that he can do to, to improve his game. I would say that the thing that comes to, to mind, my untrained eye, I should say, and, you know, and, and I think that is important um, to acknowledge is that as much as we can dive into trying to know football and I, and I do think the media and you guys are part of this do a good job um, to, to be as, you know, informed as you can be, but we, we don't know the whole story, but I'll say this it, to me, it's decisiveness. And, and you saw this last year when he made the, the, the real turn to going towards that MVP tear that he went on to me, it was decisiveness. And I think that he wants to make a big play at, at every snap. And he can, and that's almost, he's a prisoner of his own abilities at times because it's there. But it, I think for this offense, especially as they're constituted with the injuries and all the moving pieces, the, the quicker that Lamar can decide, I'm either handing this thing off and a read option or whatever that might be, or I'm getting it to one of my guys, Mark Andrews, Sneed, Boykin, Marquise, or I'm just tucking it and going, or I'm throwing it out of bounds. The quicker that he can make those decisions, I think the better. And it's, it's not cliche because it's, it's a reality that you see in some of the, the best quarterbacks take what's there at times too. I mean, there might be a, a home run play to Marquise or to somebody down the field that, yeah, if you hit it, it's a momentum shifter. It's a game changer, but again, sort of going to where the, the energy around this offense is right now, the more singles and doubles that he can hit and, and then the triple and, uh, one or two home runs a game, that to me is a win. So making those decisive decisions that I know he can make because he's proven to be able to do it, and I, I have belief in his command of the offense, um, the, the quicker he can do that, I think the better. Yeah, that's a very good point. And talk about a guy that you said you root for for people. That That is one guy that is easy to root for. I mean, I, we've no said it many times, the most lovable superstar I think I, I can ever remember and, and humble – uh, you know, humble beyond belief. But one, one thing I wanted to ask you about, you, we touched a lot of, on injury throughout this call. And, I, I, you know, with Nick Boyle going down, looks like he's on the IR, Bonds going down. Injuries are really starting to stack up. At what point does do they just hit a tipping point? Like, is there too many injuries? Or do you think the Ravens still have enough in-house to still get where they want to be? Glenn, it's a great question. And I think we're going to find out. I mean, starting this weekend against Tennessee and then obviously uh, that short week, they've got Pittsburgh on Thursday night. I mean, as you know, as those of us who cover this team, but those guys in the building, I mean, I, I've talked to guys about this. They, they looked at the post by stretch that they're in the middle of right now is the real identifier of who this team was going to be in terms of the eventual goals. There's no doubt that they, they, they'll probably be able to get in the playoffs based off of how good they are and you get the extra team at this point. Um, but in terms of achieving the, the real goals um, that have been laid out since day one, really since they lost to Tennessee last year, um, that, that's going to be figured out here in the next few weeks. And to your point, yeah, I do think there's a tipping point when it comes to injuries. I mean, players and coaches never want to acknowledge it because they know how excuses will be latched onto from us and the media and from fan bases. And as much as it could be a reality, we just won't allow it for whatever reason. But I'm just a big believer in, 
you look at teams and you go, how did this happen? Well, all right, look at the depth chart. All right, they lost their entire secondary. Oh, okay, what's going on with that offense? Well, their offensive line is, and I'm not saying specific to Baltimore. I'm just saying year in and year out, mm-hmm. you can have answers to unintended consequences at times, and it, and it often revolves around injuries. So I do think that going back to what we said, that is this going to be that hinge point in the season for Baltimore that we've seen in years past where they make some drastic changes due to being forced to by injury or by the coaching staff identifying problem areas and then boom, they catch that, that momentum swing or does it just become too much to handle that, that, that really will be to me discovered probably in the next three, three games, I would say. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. And I'm really excited to see this game coming up. Um, I'm sure you guys are as well, uh, based on the fact that, you know, you mentioned it, that playoff game last year was mm. was a shocker to pretty much everyone in Baltimore. The air was sucked out of the city at, <laughs> by the end of the It was just incredible. I mean, the energy was palpable at the yeah. beginning, you know, the beginning of that game. And then it was just a ghost town thereafter. Um, so do you think this game has extra meaning for the players who are involved in the game last season as well? And not just the players, the coaches, uh, in, you know, in addition to the players, do you think for the coaches has extra meaning as well? Well, look, I, I think if you'd asked them that question, hmm. maybe during the bye week, they would have said, yeah. I mean, I was there. I was on the sideline. And to your point, I mean, being in the city, the, the six days leading up to the game or whatever it was, five days, and then it's this uncharacteristically warm night. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better uh, atmosphere and and you know just environment to have a big game and and yeah it, it was immediately sucked out and it was something that everybody in that building has lived with over the course of the preceding months but I just think there's so much more right in front of their face right now in terms of how do we how do we sort of cover up these wounds that are gaping due to big injuries at important positions and sort of rediscovering our identity whatever the version in 2020 is some confidence, some consistency. I think that just becomes the priority. And the fact that it's the team that beat them in the divisional round a year ago is probably so low at this mm. point that they don't, that it could be anybody. It could be Pittsburgh. It could be Tennessee. It could be the 0 and 9 Jets. And for them, I would have to imagine it's all about, let's just rediscover ourselves here and get some momentum going as we hit this critical point. Yeah. And with Derrick Henry coming to town, it makes me a little bit nervous, Evan, because New England was running at will, it seemed like, over the – now, I know that the conditions certainly played a part in it, and they have a fantastic offensive line in New England. I know the Titans' offensive line's a little bit banged up this season. Uh, but how confident are you? Because Calais Campbell, as far as I know, he's looking to to miss this week. I don't know what Brandon Williams is looking like, but how, how worried are you with Derrick Henry coming to town that – the Ravens are struggling to stop the run right now. Well, it has to be a concern. And and I I think it was laid out as much by this team in in the aftermath of the the Patriots loss. And and you mentioned it, those are huge injuries in in the core and the guts of that defensive line. And that was such a priority in the off season to try and shore up things that were a problem in the Tennessee game. And really throughout that year, uh, kind of got lost in how dominant they were offensively. They just had trouble stopping the run and, and dealing with things on the edges there defensively. And they seem to have had it figured out, but now some of those pieces aren't there, most notably Calais. Uh, I, I think that it actually helps that they were, for lack of a better term, um, exposed, embarrassed, frustrated by what New England does because it does allow for an extra attention to detail because you're still dealing with with a lot of young players, especially like guy like Patrick Queen, for example, doesn't have his best game in New England. I mean, not that he hasn't been preparing week in and week out, but it, look, it's gonna it's gonna weigh on you. You're gonna want to be that much better the next week, and he's got an obvious test um, this week in, in Derrick Henry. But conversely, I think it, it's it's unfortunate that they're dealing with a Tennessee team that's as desperate as they are, because yeah. Derrick Henry hasn't been the player that he was in the first, whatever it was, six games of the season when they started 6-0 and and then lost to, to Pittsburgh. And so th- this Tennessee team comes here going, well, we got to rediscover who we are in Baltimore in terms of our ability to run the, the ball and be dominant. So it, it, it's kind of one of those. And it's fun for, for us in, in building up these games. It's, you know, what's going to win out, the, the frustrated run defense or – 
the run uh, offense that that wants to uh, take over games. Yeah, the fan in me was kind of happy to see Indy beat Tennessee because I just have this axe to grind with Tennessee. Uh, now, you know, from the time they took us out last year, but then I was talking to Glenn about it and I was like, now they're going to have 10 days yeah. to sit at home and mull over. And then they see the, the, the Patriots game where they just ran it down our throats and they're like, well, we got a better running back than them. So, uh, you know, that's exactly what they're going to do. So you talked about the stubbornness to the run game. I'm pretty sure they're going to be pretty stubborn towards that run game. But uh, you mentioned a couple of these things, but if you could, if you could give say two or three specific things the Ravens need to do to come up with a victory on Sunday, what, what would those things be in your mind? Well, I think it starts where we, we just you know, finished there. It, it, it's defensively. I, I really do believe two guys, big picture that as much as we want to, and Lamar is the face of this franchise for good reason. I still think this team's best chance to accomplish its goals is if the defense is the leader, if it's the, because it needs to be the most, most consistent unit week in and week out, because I think for better or for worse, it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster offensively. There's going to be ups and the highs are supremely high and the lows are going to be frustrating and can be ugly at times. So this defense has to be a week in and week out unit. That's top five, top, you know, in, in all categories. And, and they've shown that. So to me, that's priority number one against Tennessee. Rediscover that ability to stop the run, completely take over games, get the takeaways, and kind of put an imprint on the game. And, and so if they can do that, and then conversely, the offense has the latitude, if you will, to have those ebbs and flows, then that to me becomes beneficial for this entire team. And then that offense, it, it, it has to, as, as we touched upon earlier, to me, be decisive and be stubborn. It, yes, I'm not saying you don't want to try and take deep shots, but just because the defense is stacking up against what it is you do in the run game uh, and, and maybe knows some of your tendencies, okay, let's see if you can contain it over the course of four quarters. And uh, that, to me, uh, is, is something that could be successful over the course of time. But it is so much contingent on that defense really carrying the weight of things to not allow Tennessee to grab a lead. Cause as I know you guys have discussed, we've all discussed that when they're having to play from behind, it, it forces them to get out of character and not be able to be as stubborn in what they do offensively. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. Cause I think uh, we're seeing teams employ the same sort of system that, uh, well, the ball control, uh, you know, th that's what killed a lot of teams, a lot of Ravens opponents last season. It seems like as of late, that's what we're seeing happen against the Ravens. Uh, so hopefully they can keep the Titans off offense off the field and give the Ravens offense. And, uh, I, and I would say too, but like, don't abandon it so quickly. Like right. if, if, if Tennessee, for whatever reason, were to get up 10, nothing, um, mm -hmm. maybe two touchdowns, let's say, I can't even remember what the Indy score was, but you know, it, to me, it, that, and that's why I use the word stubborn. It's like, be stubborn in the third quarter if you're still down 10 or, or you know, two touchdowns. Um, and this is not, you know, I know analytics can be a driving force in some of the decisions on how to do things. But to me, it just, it feels like um, I, I kind of want to see these guys just be like, you know what, we're going to do what we do. You might know it's coming, but we just think we can out execute you. Um, because I do think, they still have, uh, despite a lot of the, the, you know, the changing parts up front, the pieces to be able to still make yardage, uh, e even if that's the case. Yeah, they, they, luckily they were able to get some depth there, uh, no doubt about that. Jimmy, sounds like you, man. That's that's what you always say. Seriously, I don't care if they I'm, know we're doing it. If you out execute right. them, it doesn't it, it doesn't really yep. matter. Well, you, go ahead, go ahead, Jimmy. No, I was saying you were drawing comparisons there, and I said this a couple shows back that everyone knows when Steph Curry and Klay Thompson are on the court what they're going to do. They're going to shoot it from deep. They're going to shoot it from 30, but it's about stopping it, right? Like everyone knows when 35 is 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 in the backfield, we're going to run it, but Gus still averages, you know, close to five yards a carry. Like these things, it's about execution, not always about deception. I think execution is more sustainable as far as being a consistent, good offense than just being deceptive. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. And, and, and what it does, and, and we've seen this um, with this group, but really across um, football in general, the league in general, is that once you, you're, you kind of get lathered up, if you will, then you can sprinkle in some of those uh, other aspects that can 
rely on deception and can look for chunk plays downfield. So, uh, look, it, it, it's a lot of moving parts, as it always is, but it, it does feel like, to me, as much as we want to talk about the offense, it starts defensively. Because if this defense can be what they are when they're at their best, then I think it allows for so much more room on the offensive side to, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, guest test and revise throughout a game. Yeah. Oh, well, last one is a, is a two-parter, Evan. What is your prediction for what actually happens this Sunday and for the rest of the season for the Ravens? All right. Well, thankfully, I mean, for your case, I'm not doing the game, so I guess I can have a prediction. Uh, <laughs> let me think here. I, you know, I, I do. Uh, I think that despite the fact that home and away this year means really nothing, uh, I, I, I do think it helps that they're in kind of what could be described as friendly confines um, at M&T Bank. So I think that's helpful. Uh, I, I am concerned a lot about uh, all the injuries, especially what they're dealing with in the offensive line. And look, you can call Nick Boyle. I mean, he makes plays in the passing game, but he's basically another offensive lineman that they lost. Um, so uh, I, I, I do think that they could that they could squeeze out um, a game here. I think it's going to be tight. I, I don't think it. I don't expect it to be high scoring. So let's say something in the ballpark of you know twenty one seventeen Baltimore uh, against the Titans. And in terms of the the rest of the season, I mean I'm not ready to go into the postseason just because I mean look I and th this isn't uh, sort of deflecting or 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 being a, a coward of, against making a call. It's just, it's the reality of the year where I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in terms of what player is going to be COVID reserve or close yeah. contact. And I, I do think that we've kind of gotten into a rhythm with it, especially those of us covering it and having to go to games and knowing like, all right, is this games are happening. So that, that part's great. So it kind of feels like we've put that at least to bed for now. Um, but in terms of predictions, it's just hard to think about what the postseason would be. But I do think the Ravens are a playoff team. But to me, it feels like, unfortunately, for this fan base, even though they can't go to games or for this team, I don't think it's going to be happening at home. I think they're going to have to go on the road from, you know, the get go, just because Pittsburgh is in a position to me where, where they've got it going. Um, yeah. So I think that this this Ravens team is a playoff team that's going to have to go on the road to achieve their goals when it comes to, uh, you know, whether it be just winning a playoff game, getting to an AFC championship game, or obviously heading to Tampa, if that's possible. Mm. Well, it's definitely going to be interesting when, like you said, roller coaster ride. Uh, you know, I got my Tylenol ready to go every game. That might not Tylenol. be long enough. <laughs> and, and my Tums, you know what I mean? All you got to do is get in the playoffs. Hurting. You don't know what happens after that. Just get in the tournament, right? Right. Yeah. My thing is like for all for all the fans that um, come up to me and, and ask, you know, what's going wrong or this or that. I mean, again, going back to what we said, just just think of Ray Rice and whatever that play was in San Diego. Was it yep. like fourth and 34 or 24 or something? Mm -hmm. I mean, that that play, he doesn't get that first down. It ain't happening. I mean, there's nothing. So right. it's, it's just take your mind back to those moments as a, as a Ravens fan. And I think. Uh, the, the sooner you can feel comfortable and the uncomfortable, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, I totally agree. And we appreciate your time. Uh, I know you're a very busy man. So why don't you let our, uh, our viewers know where they can find the stuff you're working on, what you're working on and things of that nature. Yeah, well, I appreciate that guys. Um, I, I mean, I would say uh, any Sunday you're going to find me at some game. I was lucky enough to be uh, in Arizona uh, on Sunday for oh, that wow. Bills Cardinals game. That was unbelievable Crazy. in terms of a finish uh so this week um i'm going to be because it's always funny oh i'm gonna be in jacksonville so i get to see pittsburgh uh, uh up close and personal again for i think the third time this season a real tough and, one for them yeah well you never know i you mean never jacksonville know. Gave, gave green bay a, uh, a scare there last sunday uh but yeah every sunday uh, nfl on cbs i do do stuff for the ravens on a weekly basis i do a sit down obviously this year it's via uh, Zoom with a player each week. And I know that that airs on a variety of platforms. Um, and then you can see me at Eddie's uh, picking up groceries or walking my dog uh, <laughs> around uh, nice. Roland Park. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thanks again for your time. Have a great evening. You got it, guys. Good to be thanks, with you. Evan. Yep.